this guy here will be the real flow detector for concrete in that it will point out with a very strong reflection the slightest interface such as a void, such as small delamination, cold joint, you name it. Well, echometric techniques uh, are basically, the, the general rule is whatever you see, the best will make you blind below. So with GPR, I'm very sharp with three bars. Well, I'm fortunately, I won't be able to see well past dense reinforcement and it can travel through hair so it can, it's not the number one candidate for small defects such as small delaminations. On the other side, ultrasound will be limited by even the smallest air interface. And of course, it's not the number one for locating rebars. Okay, this uh, focusing further down for uh, bridge or more generally post tension uh, structures, <laughs> we can see that the location of PT ducts, uh, even behind uh, uh, reg conventional reinforcement, is quite immediate and easy to do with the GPR, but this large amount of steel that I have by definition inside the duct may be a plastic duct, may be an, an aluminum duct, we don't care, but there is too much steel providing a very strong reflection, no chance of seeing a, a small uh, interface of air such as the one that we systematically see in case of crowding defects. That's why we call in the, uh, for voids detection inside PT ducts, ultrasound are by definition of physics, the only ones having a chance to assess whether this element is totally filled with grout or not. Okay, just a, one single slide to, for the measuring principle of the other methodology that we'll be touching today in the cases that we'll be presenting, uh, half cell potential. Uh, well, in general terms, uh, corrosion is an electrochemical process. So we develop an electrochemical cell uh, occurs uh, whenever uh, external boundary conditions allow. In general terms, we observe that whenever there is a high carbonation, a local availability of oxygen and moisture water. In this case, what happens, there is a net voltage difference between different portions of the rebars, and we have the chance of mapping this low negative potential areas by mean of an electrode or generally by mean of a voltmeter connected to an uh, electrode which can be a simple handheld electrode or wheel electrode for providing higher productivity but in general terms what we want to do is mapping an area and uh, uh, highlighting negative values that we will go through some details how statistical analysis can allow to set some threshold, uh, some alarm or uh, priorities of intervention, uh, intervention levels. Okay, uh, moving on with, uh, uh, with the real cases. Uh, I started with this uh, combined investigation uh, because, in my opinion, it provides uh, a good uh, uh, first feeling of the complementarity of these techniques. This was a road tunnel, very damaged visually, and as always, okay, we can see the, the visually damaged areas, but how can we, we be sure that similar uh, damages are not hidden behind the structures? 
So uh, first of all, let's go with the most pro um, productive uh, and expeditive investigation, which is um, uh, GPR. So we started scanning, in this case, on a number of longitudinal scans throughout the whole, uh, the whole structure. In this case, it was limited to three uh, scans. And uh, uh, let's see what we get. I prefer actually to show whenever I can real data, a little less boring than, uh, than a naked slides. Uh, okay, uh, here we have an overview of 100 meter scan. Can't remember whether it was the upper or on the side. But okay, what kind of information can we gather for this? First of all, zooming in, uh, I can immediately appreciate uh, how there is a very heterogeneous uh, uh, reinforcement, both in terms of uh, uh, cover, we'll see going on, okay, then in uh, spacing, I'm pretty sure Okay, well, at some point, somebody changed the, uh, their mind, so no more shallow reinforcement, but uh, only deep reinforcement and total lack of uh, shallow reinforcement in some of the segments. Then other areas with very variable uh, cover, um, I can also notice that, hey, why are these some areas very sharp in terms of reflection where some others are very shady? That is another information. So just to make it short, uh, basically we ended up with, uh, by assessing very irregular uh, structural details, very variable amplitudes of reflection hinting different corrosion levels ongoing, but we weren't that happy with back wall detection, total thickness of the lining. Okay, lucky for us, there was uh, the other combined methodology, which is uh, the ultrasonic tomography by mean of which we perform a number of linear scans in this case, uh, and on sound versus deteriorated areas. This slide presents the results of what it was verified of sound areas. Always a clear back wall reflection, um, not very details on, on the surface, but the thickness of the lining very well consistent with the geometry. So a thinner lining on the top, a thicker lining on the sides of the tunnels. Okay, those were the good spots. How do we recognize bad spots? Okay, this was the first case of a database that we actually built throughout the investigations, uh, putting down some recurring features. For example, we see the back wall disappear in some locations, you see it's a blank spot of the back wall. Okay, that is indicative of a defective area somewhere below, uh, the, somewhere on top of the, of the back wall. Uh, other, in other cases, you can really clearly see a diagonal profile, which was later verified and confirmed as being uh, delamination, corrosion-induced delamination. So these areas are physiologically bound to detach and fall. Uh, shallow delaminations may sometimes are visible on the surface, other times are not, but they are always uh, an alarm zone and that also they hide what is behind. So that is the first idea of a combined uh, approach for the detection. That is done uh, on, a, on a tunnel. Uh, other examples were done on uh, actually tunnel uh, on uh, bridge decks, uh, 
uh, always large areas. Now, uh, a second case I would like to discuss, you know, focusing down and starting from the detail. In this case, we were looking for validating a standard approach for the verification of uh, structural elements where as-built draws are not available. And so uh, all information is useful for recalculation. So in this case, this is a highway bridge, uh, a number of different locations, just like the ones you see were investigated. And uh, uh, we performed a number of aerial scans on both sides of the element and on the intradose. Okay, this brings me to the second case that I want to share with you uh, should be this one. Yeah, okay. In this case, for those who are not so familiar with GPR, we are looking at the collection of a number of 31 profiles, yes, 19 vertical and others horizontal that were basically merged together in order to provide a volume view. Pretty easy to do. We're staying inside the uh, dedicated software uh, that the user has right when measuring. Okay, so we have an XY visualization. We can scroll through different depths. So I see, okay, apart from the first layer, I can see starting from this uh, 9 to 15 cm a level of rebars, of bent rebars, then going deeper they disappear and then they reappear. You can see it's more evident on the one on the right. And then you probably, yes, see the second backward. So in this case, just by looking at one side, you can, all, you can already have a reasonable assessment. And uh, of course, you can actually uh, even go more colorful, uh, pro probably uh, by, let's, let's try to have a quick overview. I'm just simulating what I would be doing on site right after the measurement. So yeah, uh, I confirm that I see at least the two rebars, two orders of parallel bent rebars. Okay, it's pretty colorful, it's very nice, it's good for providing a, a, an immediate report to if we have any audience, but you know, uh, as much as I love imaging, I uh, imaging by itself uh, is at risk of missing information if not confirmed by raw data. So this is the first example where I be pointing out is let's use imaging 3D, 2D slicing for having a first idea of what we see. But in case of doubt, always go back to the first row data. Now, just for, let me check this, rebar, this couple of rebars by mean of a number by looking at these original death scans that I performed uh, vertically. I expect to see some rebars at the beginning of the scans. Let's go check them. Okay, yes, I see these two hyperbolas. And let me scroll through and I see that they are moving from left to right. Perfect. So yeah, I can easily confirm that these are two rebars. But, oops, I'm sorry. Let's go back there. If I do this, if I play the same trick here and I check this couple signals here, I can see that there is a more complex scenario. 
I have a very, uh, I have an antenna providing an extreme resolution in this case. That was the highest frequency antenna of, uh, of Prosec. So able to discriminate what, yeah, they seem to be three rebars actually. If I look at them systematically, at the end, I will probably end up pointing out to somebody on site that, sir, you don't have two, but you have, as a matter of fact, three. I can follow these three elements, different elements. So to make a long story short, this is basically what we ended up putting in the report uh, that was extended to the whole area. Okay, couple of rebars, couple of rebars, three rebars. We have the hardware tools providing the highest definition. We need to be responsible enough to not, not to lose this information and make the best use of uh, old school hyperbola peaking together with uh, uh, very productive area imaging uh, uh, strategies. That is the, the first learning that among the first learning that we did in our experimentation. Uh, moving on, uh, another region, another area. Uh, the name of the game here was uh, we have uh, post-tension beams, pretty big, uh, ranging from 30 to 70 meters each, ranging from one to two meters of height. So productivity, it was a key point here. Uh, we're not doing only academic research playing on narrow spaces, uh, narrow areas, but we need to be productive and deliver information on a real structure. So uh, we faced, and this first example is, uh, I think is a 30 or 40 meters long girder our approach was let's go for a coarse grid. GPR is not useful only if you scan five by five or 10 by 10. Hey, you have a life. So uh, in this specific case, uh, we our strategy was to the combined use of a number of transverse scan on all surfaces of the uh, element. And these sections were taken about one meters apart. And then an, a cap, so a limited number of scans by means of, you know, telescopic roads or rods or whatever, by bridge. So basically combining the most efficient tools we had to cover the to investigate on small areas we all know that pt ducks are nasty creatures uh, crowding together and hiding uh, very often in the bottom of a small area so you don't want you want to have the smallest footprint you can have in order to lose as little information as you can so in this case, uh, again, we witness a very powerful hardware uh, giving us, uh, uh, and let's move here. Okay, this is just some samples that we took, but you can see that I have a back wall here at around 20 cm. So in such a narrow space, uh, I can easily count one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, at least six uh, PT ducks. Uh, just for confirmation, if I change the position, I systematically see that uh, conventional reinforcement stay at the same height and PT ducks uh, uh, move along. Okay. Uh, we need uh, an efficient tool for reporting this. So again, we combined uh, this into this um, here. 
Okay, so this is the actual report that we, we can provide, even if we don't scan as fine as 5 or 10 cm. Basically, it's the combination of uh, advanced processing enabling us to project the scans where they belong, whether they are taken on a vertical part, diagonal, on the intradose, whatever, and then connecting the dots, old school, just because we have an efficient tool able to discriminate such hyperbolas. This way, I mean, in about uh, eight, eight hours of two people, uh, we can, uh, 30 meter beam can be reasonably done and reported with the exact positioning of <clears throat> traditional, conventional, and PT uh, reinforcement and PT ducts. Okay, this case was, in this case, GPR was a part of the activity because, okay, we counted a good number of, I can't remember, well, let's say uh, 12, 15 PT ducts. How are they doing? Uh, are they well injected? Is there any defects in the grout? Okay, traditional approach is drilling and uh, uh, video borehole inspection. Nothing against that, but we simply now are able to provide some points where to focus on for verification. You don't have, you can't random hit 30 meters of, of girder, 10, 15 PT ducts. Okay, where are you going to drill? How lucky do you need to be in order to get uh, an actual defect? How about we use the partner of the GPR, which is the ultrasonic tomography? In this case, I guess we sampled a number of possible locations that were investigated by mean of uh, uh, the so-called stripe scan. We have some detail here. Basically, once you trace, you position your duct, you perform a number of measurements with your probe across the duct. And it's a B scan similar to the GPR. So in this view, we see uh, the length on, of the probe versus the depth. And I can see a nice dot at around, let's call them 15, 12, 15 cm. How come this dot is faded and weak and this dot is brilliant, uh, is, is uh, very shiny, intense? Okay, if we plot this in a similar view as we saw before, so here we are looking at the view with the X length of the probe versus Y length of the profile versus depth. I will focus my depth in the interval, in the interval that the PT duct here, and I can immediately classify the area stating, well, very reasonably, this as comparison, low intensity. Okay, high intensity. That is the number one spot you have to begin with, with direct uh, inspection, with uh, drilling and borehole. In fact, uh, this is the standard report. Uh, these are some of the standard reports that are accepted now and are required by the transportation agencies. Uh, and in this case, we can witness how a direct verification that was suggested resulted in an actual local lack of grout. Okay, so we found, uh, we defined the structural details, we gave an insight, or rather we gave some guide, uh, guidance for uh, inspection. 
how about a general overview of uh, uh, the risk of corrosion on along the whole uh, girder? In this specific case, what was done was the scanning of the intradose of the of the girders. You can already notice that the environment is that the same environment where uh, the GPR results were presented. So you you can have a an immediate overview. Uh, what you see here clear is this small rectangle of the intradose where basically you plot down the results in terms of millivolts. Uh, there's literature and there are guidelines telling me what to do with this value. The more accepted approach is uh, basically looking at the distribution, more specifically the cumulative distribution of these values and point out all the points where such slope change. I will look for the bending in this curve. Once I assign these values, I, have, uh, I can assess that values more negative than this are very likely to be representative of actively corroding areas. Areas with a higher, less negative potential are very likely to be sound areas, leaving some room in between. But again, I have a first idea of priorities of intervention. Uh, of intervention. First of all, hey, let's go check close to the abutment of the girder typical problem with uh, uh, membranes, with insulating uh, uh, membranes failing in times and, you know, the, 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 the end of the girder is very often critical for that. But not only, uh, local spots could run unseen while with this, guideline, with this guidance, again, it's not the only and ultimate answer but it's a reason for direct verifications to be properly positioned. So, okay, good. Next one, uh, um, another, another highway, another bridge. In this case, uh, uh, a specific girder had to be removed because it was somehow already damaged. And so it was the chance to organize the uh, common test site for different labs, different methodologies. Uh, a couple of universities attended also. Our role in that was, okay, let's try to, do, to combine what they did in the first example, fine grid um, on a large surface. Okay, so in this case, it, we took as well one full day only for scanning GPR. Uh, again, key point having small probes in order to fit on these, these very narrow uh, points that are the most interesting to look into. Uh, so we split the whole area in about 10 different areas from the front, from the back, the top, wherever. And this is an example of uh, one of those areas as seen while measuring. Uh, so let me get back to the data itself. Yes. And again, Old school plus new school. First of all, I let the great imaging that I have drive. Let, let's see what catches my attention and I will later verify on the single scan on the single row data. In this case, I can scroll through 
uh, a first layer of conventional reinforcement for sure. And as I glide deeper, you can see, you can already start seeing curved elements emerging at the various depth. Okay, we got already something to work with and probably after a certain depth I will bounce against the okay there's a further PT duct lost in depth before what appears last as the conventional reinforcement of the uh, of the second layer uh, and again just to mimic what the approach that we teach on site to the to our teams okay you saw something interesting uh, at some point good uh, let's for example cut this slice here and let's go to the naked data fine i can see you know uh, and let's scroll again the visual movement is always helpful i probably will see this spoiler uh, alert i think this is a conventional straight rebars so always at the same height when i scroll through but you know these two other hyperbolas are very likely or for sure and the third one appearing there so i can rest assured and do uh, and claim that what they are once you combine the whole data into onto a single uh, uh, environment, this is basically what you are able to do. These are the actual field data that I had ready. And again i can enjoy i put down all together the uh, all the scans should be there yes where they belong so i can navigate throughout all the different positions and angles where i collected this data uh, just let me put down a couple for for reference for give the uh, the idea again I'm not particularly talking about a specific hardware or software again I'm talking the idea of combining uh, the power of uh, imaging together with uh, clear and uh, finite answer. Uh, do we have anything horizontal? Probably not in this data set, whatever. So if at this point I can cut this volume that I compiled, I can look at it all at once let's see who wow what is this sharp reflection here do we have any reason to believe it's a uh, pt duct uh, well it seems to be this baby here so yes it's there how about we okay it seems to go right there so no actual artificial intelligence, but rather a combination of computational power and human patience, sliding, slicing the volume uh, across all the proper directions until you get a good uh, assurance about all the reinforcements now let me get them all at once for you but basically this is the confirmation that we want 
about the structural details. So basically this is, again, not different than the very first example that I provided on a small area. We just can suggest to implement that on a larger, on a larger scale. Okay, we were not there only for GPR, but also, again, on the same, uh, uh, on the same element, a number of selected of uh, PT ducts were, uh, were analyzed by ultrasonic thermography. Uh, again, data fusion, I, I've been hearing about data fusion since I began my career. Uh, okay, this is what I consider today the state of the art of data fusion. Uh, it's not only fancy, it's useful. It's useful for the final uh, uh, inspector to be able to have a clear overview of what is where under the same system of coordinates, then having the attention areas positioned where they belong. And this is a specific example that, that I took because uh, when we went for direct verification, and it was for sure, oh, direct verification in this case was easy because these, uh, these all element need to be de needed to be demolished after. So we opened the whole thing and we checked. And in fact, we saw that some of the attention areas weren't actually due to uh, lack of grout but the higher sens sensitivity of ultrasound will point out even areas with small interfaces between the, uh, the single strands and the sheet will be labeled as attention areas. Just like areas where the grout is there, but there's a micro systematic micro cracking of the areas, uh, probably due to uh, freezing, uh, whatever. So uh, it is not the goal of our NDT methodologies to actually point out what are the structural deficiency deficiencies uh, without, uh, without further confirmation. But what was quite appreciated was the conservative approach that we were able to provide, meaning, okay, I'm not sure whether this is a simple strand touching the, the sheet or whatever, but if you have to drill in one point, please drill here. If this is not a bother for you, structural engineer, as a role, you know, as my customer of my NDTs, then you can rest assured that the rest of the investigated areas are okay. Uh, of course, uh, the electrical methods were also requested. And in this case, the ease of accessibility allowed us to actually provide a full mapping of all the surfaces, uh, vertical inclined surfaces of both sides, providing us a richer database, basically. This is a little bit more uh, school book, textbook uh, curve. You can somehow clearly see the two bells actually uh, corresponding to lower, more negative potential areas corroding, differentiating from areas with higher potential, very unlikely to be corroding more easily to, to be picked by the of the distribution curve which ultimately leads to this kind of simplified of view that for the asset manager, for the owner of the, of the structure is, hey, 
don't waste time and direct verification here on the red. Save your money on the green areas. Those are probably not your concern. These are the guidelines that we provided. Okay. Dr. Tronka, sorry for interrupting yeah. you. Uh, we, the session is going to last for under five, 10 minutes because we need to have a question session for under 10 minutes after your talk. Absolutely, absolutely. This was the last challenging uh, case. That's the last one, I will just mention it. As please please take it in, you've got some more 10 application. minutes here. Sorry for interrupting you, please no, go ahead, sir. Couple of minutes, no need to go into to too many details here, but I just wanted to provide a different idea of scenario. Here, GPR is not as much for structural details, draws were available, but the concern was uh, uh, risk of corrosion and deterioration assessment. So in this case, we relied on what we learned uh, on the fundamentals of, did I skip anything? No, should be fine. Um, on, the, on something that, quite assessed by any of our colleagues of ASTM stating, you want to check a reinforced structure uh, for corrosion with GPR. Okay, take a look at is available at the bottom deck reflection and take a look at the uh, intensities of the top layer of the rebars. Uh, so, in general terms, when I look at the rebar, I can variation of intensity. I can witness high intensities, strong reflections versus weak reflections. Okay, it is accepted and consolidated that those are the areas uh, at risk of corrosion. So when you're basically dealing with large structure, in this case, it could be a bridge deck, it could be a bridge girder. This example I'm providing here is a number of longitudinal stands taken along the girders. And uh, let me scroll right away one last time here, just to show you real time. from beam picking, yes, why not? Uh, ba, 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 ba. Nah. Okay, this is the scan you saw in the picture. So about 30 meters of a beam, you can see a variable back wall due to the different local composition of the concrete first layer of rebars and PT ducts uh, intercepted going down and then going up. The name of the game here, apart from technicalities, is quite simple. I will compile an auto detection of the rebars. You can see it more narrow to, to have a better. Once I train my software to look for rebars, I can look them probably even with dots. Okay, nice because I'm not now doing it manually, but most important because for every single rebar, a cover is recorded and its relative intensity is recorded. Those are the two key parameters for getting to this kind of reports telling me, okay, first of all, cover key parameters, rebar amplitude, no large variation, back wall, that was something that was further processed. Uh, just to close by saying that this is the typical output for quantitative analysis on line scan, these kind of results are more commonly delivered, especially in case of large areas like, such as bridge decks in terms of areas. So we grid those results. And these are two consolidated deliverables standard in the practice of corrosion analysis. 
cover map of across the whole area and corrosion map uh, pointing out in red the areas uh, at uh, uh, low intensity. That is that was were just my keynotes, uh, closing notes about in a nutshell the key benefits that are worth our attention can involve both uh, me and my team today as on-site practitioner first of all performing hardware that wasn't able 10 years ago wasn't available 10 years ago uh, high resolution immediate insight and real-time remote support i didn't the details of the cloud of the data sharing but for my young technicians on site they can trust of having me at my desk following them in real time for example me if i consider myself the one responsible for reporting uh, i like saving time with quick reporting tools but also for having flexible comprehensive solution able to deliver this, this data fusion capabilities and of course i am virtually on site of any user uh, in the world by mean of those, this cloud architecture for the customer uh, maybe the uh, civil engineer the the or the, the manager Basically, prompt actions are a result of an efficient workflow and uh, a prior comprehensive overview onto a same software architecture is very appreciated. And of course, priorities for maintenance and actions are. So this is basically the scenario as we picture it in Italy today and uh, we'll stop right here i i went probably as always long enough and thanks once again open to any questions starting from now thank you dr tronka that was a fantastic uh, technical talk it was really good actually now the question and answer sessions are open uh, you can start one by one we'll have a 10 minutes question and answer session so i think someone had raised your hand please Put your questions forward. Well, uh, Mr. Mohammed. <coughs> Hello. Yes. Good evening, yeah. Williams Joy, Senior Division Engineer, Railways. Sir, I may... Please go ahead, sir. So this is Williams Joy, Senior Division Engineer, Railways. I'm having a question to Mr. Tronka. Uh, do we have the technology? Because of most of our railway bridges constructed in the in the uh, British era are of, of, of the stone masonry. So when we go for the gauge conversion for, for the increase in loading, uh, whether we have techniques to do the NDT of the stone masonry, stone masonry piers, stone masonry abutments. Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh... I didn't uh, get, I didn't have ready any application case, but for sure, both methodologies, the two methodologies that I presented today, uh, GPR and ultrasonic tomography, have a great value in uh, uh, masonry, uh, especially stone masonry. Uh, so, of course, the approach changes that the, it becomes a more of a semi-quantitative approach where forget about corrosion analysis, but just to mention a few, humidity mapping, uh, uh, that's something I was asked several times to do onto railway bridges in, uh, in uh, brick masonry. Uh, locations of defects onto large uh, stone block is something quite successfully addressed uh, with ultrasonic tomography. Uh, it is quite likely that the devices, the GPR that I presented today, those are the guys 
specific for uh, for the concrete. Uh, when you're dealing with large elements in masonry, maybe brick or stone masonry, lower frequencies GPR may be even more efficient. And I'm thinking about this uh, GS. Uh, uh, 8,000 of Prosec, for example, that really complements the range and extends uh, uh, the investigation range also to large uh, masonry, mas masonry elements. Um, could be also almost worth a talk in itself, but uh, yeah, forget about electrical methods, GPR, maybe varying methodology, and ultrasound. Also, the dear old uh, transmission receiver ultrasound are still an efficient tool. But those, so uh, I would suggest looking into those three, uh, three approaches. And of course, able to go in case, case by case in providing whatever expertise I, or suggestion I can onto any actual case. Um, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would request Mr. Baskar to put his question now. Mr. Baskar. Hi. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, this is about uh, the GPR-based corrosion. So is there any uh, surface deterioration on the concrete surface? Or is uh, the data is from the real structure or uh, laboratory-based investigation? Just would like to. Uh, I'm not sure I uh, I got the point. Okay, talking about corrosion analysis with GPR. Yeah. Uh, what what is the specific question again? No, the question is: uh, Is it uh, the uh, investigation on a real structure or uh, a demo concrete structure? Oh no, those are all real structures. So okay. how the sur surface quality while while collecting the data? So because corrosion initiated means there may be uh, delamination or cracking or signs of corrosion. So uh, the quality of data. Okay. Uh, well, um, the application because that also for... plays. Yeah. Uh, how much time it took uh, to, to collect this much data and also to process uh, this data. Okay, well, uh, data collection uh, depends on the, on the grid size, but whenever dealing with corrosion, uh, I always uh, tend to go for the coarse grids uh, compliance with ASTM standards. ASTM standards tell us that if you want to check a bridge, you need to run uh, scans orthogonal to the first layer of, of rebars uh, at the spacing not larger than 60 cm. I normally prescribe a half a meter, 50. So uh, it's pretty, pretty productive, uh, meaning in, uh, I can cover um, one span of a bridge deck uh, in uh, one day let's say, one user, uh, one instrument, uh, uh, let's call it uh, 40 meters by 12, uh, by whatever it is, it's uh, with one single channel, it can be six to eight hours, including uh, uh, positioning uh, and related stuff. You can speed it up by use of uh, array systems. Uh, I had some experience with those, of course, higher, higher budget of instruments and more productivity. Uh, with uh, multi-channels, you can go, let's say, probably at least four, th three times, uh, three to five times as faster even with a smaller, with, with a higher data density. Data processing uh, depends on the tool you use, but it's quite standardized. Uh, let's say that uh, 
that amount of debt, I can go into about half day to one day of one of my technicians. Always, you know, one span of a bridge deck, oh. the full lanes. Uh, it could be nice. that order of magnitude. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Basca. Our Thank next you. question is by Mr. Einar. Einar, just can you ask a question, Einar? Mr. Einar, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, please put your question forward. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Good afternoon. Uh, this two methods, CPR and UT. How far it is sensitive with respect to the surface condition of the test area? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I got it right. Pumping up my volume once again. These, these two methods, how far it is sensitive with respect to surface condition of the testing area? The area to be tested, is there any relation between surface condition and the sensitivity of the measurement? Uh, surface condition, uh, I'm not sure I'm getting the, the, the point right, but uh, GPR by definition is very little affected by surface condition. I have in mind, for example, I have no issues in investigating an asphalt covered bridge. Uh, ultrasonic tomography, on the contrary, requires a decent, well, for sure, requires a direct coupling. Forget it through the asphalt. In case the surface is very deteriorated, you can have some issues. But uh, let's say that I successfully used it even on non-flat surfaces with an irregular coating, such as spritz beton. Uh, so it's not dramatic. Uh, I'm not sure if I that was the, the, the question. Please confirm. Yes, exactly, exactly. Thank you. B.S. Sarma, you can ask a question now. Mr. B.S. Sarma? I'm trying to unmute. Yes, thank you. Uh, it was a very wonderful session. And uh, what I would like to know is uh, you initiated some uh, training program for on NDT for civil engineering uh, professionals. Can you just uh, throw some light to what exactly you have done or you are about to plan? Okay, uh, I am. Uh, uh, there, there's a pretty clear split. Uh, I follow. Uh, uh, I do training for certification of uh, personnel according to Italian standards, and that is something I do locally. I'm uh, well we are trying to push this uh, Italian standard uh, uh, outside uh, for all uh, most of the training that I do outside Italy is typically custom uh, <laughs> Uh, is typically custom based. Uh, I have a few packages, uh, for example, uh, concrete traditional concrete strength, all related to concrete strength, uh, corrosion assessment, all methodologies related to concrete to corrosion assessment, uh, GPR at various degrees. So. The, no, the normal, I have a few standard packages, but typically is really uh, regional based because different uh, colleagues may have different uh, 
uh, needs. So there is a very strong standardization for the internal market due to the requirements of certification bodies. Uh, everything that is done outside abroad, it depends. Much of my activity is on specifically on GPR slides, for example, that depending on the user, depending on the... So the answer is uh, custom-based. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you, We're running short of time. The last two more questions. Sorry, we're running short of time. We will bring the opportunity to the next person, Mr. Riyatullah Muhammad. Your question, Mr. Riyatullah Muhammad. Are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, please, good afternoon. Of course, good afternoon. Uh, uh, this is Arifayatullah. I'm uh, basically a civil inspection engineer. So I have one person. So uh, my client, one of the client, he has a big craft, uh, I think around 2.5 meter. Okay. Is it possible we can scan through GPR 8800? Uh, again, what is the object we are looking at? GPR scanning. No, 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 sure, no, no. The, the investigation object. Uh, is yeah, not... investigation uh, wrapped concrete up to 2.5 meter depth. Uh, forget about the GP series. Uh, uh, I would uh, I would move toward the GS uh, uh, 8000 for those thicknesses. Okay. And keep in mind that those thicknesses may be in the range also of the uh, pundit uh, of the ultrasonic thermography. That really depends on the concrete composition. Uh, if it's uh, Good, new, uh, okay, you can pass uh, probably two meters uh, we at ease. If it's a poor conglomerate, porous concrete decreases the rate Hello? of investigation. Uh, I would say the coupling of the GS8000 plus the, the Pandit could do, could do the job. Okay, so, okay, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for you, your thank time. You, the last two more questions for the day, because we're running short of time. Uh, the next question is by Mr. Jubaz. Jubaz. Mr. Jubaz is there? Yes, sir. Yeah, please, you can put your question forward. Okay, I have one doubt. Sir, can you please uh, interpret uh, the voids and how can you interpret the presence of voids and backward using GPR? Okay, uh, well, uh, voids uh, with GPR needs to be quite relevant to be appreciated. I probably won't choose the GPR just as I showed in the example of the tunnel. Uh, small voids or small delineations are at risk of being unseen with GPR. Uh, the Good practice of GPR anyway prescribes the use of the so-called phase analysis for uh, distinguishing between uh, a, vo and a void and, for example, a steel reinforcement. Uh, whenever I hear voids, I have the doubt that the ultrasonic tomography may be uh, in of course, if applicable. Okay, okay. One more question, sir. No, no, no. Sir. Jubez, that's, that's the last okay, question okay, because we need you, other thank participants. You. Thank you, Jubez. Okay, okay, thank you the, so much. The last two questions for the day is, one is from Selva Priya. Selva Priya can go online just ask your question ahead. Selva Priya. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening, sir. I have a doubt. If you see any delamination when you investigate on bridge, what are the remedies taken for strengthening purpose? Uh, I'm sorry, I lost. We're talking about delamination, bridge decks. Uh, again, what is the question? So, if you see any delamination when we investigate on bridge, what are the remedies taken for strengthening purpose? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get it once again. Uh, what are? She's asking her question is if they find a delamination on bridges, what are yeah. the remedies to be taken? Ooh. Uh, well, that really depends. Uh, it could be uh, either in, depending on the structural, on the extent, on the position, uh, they can vary from 
local remedial work such as injection or uh, nailing, um, pl putting metal plates and, you know, packing together the thing, or uh, no remediation, just uh, demolition of the element when it's quite severe. Normally, not a decision to be called on by the NDT inspector by, by definition. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much, sir. Thank you. The last question uh, of the day is by Mr. Somia Rajan. Somia Rajan, you can put your question. Somia Rajan, are you online? Somia Rajan, are you online? Thank you, Somia. I think so. They are not there. It was a fantastic session, Dr. Tronco. Thank you, everyone. And people who have got any queries, they can write their questions to isntchennaychapter at gmail.com, where we shall forward all these necessary questions to Dr. Tronco. And Absolutely. We'll, get the, we'll give the necessary replies to each and every individual. Absolutely. Just to remind that, you know, it's a really a pleasure and a learning for me to be around. And I already specified I consider the Indian uh, market uh, a leading role. So uh, please just address uh, by through the Institute or direct messaging. I won't run away from questions. The worst that can happen is I can't answer. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think we have come to the end of the session and uh, that is the word of thanks. So it gives me an immense pleasure to give today's word of thanks on this fantastic subject, innovative investigation technique and the data processing of assessment of bridges. We from Chennai chapter, I would thank firstly, B. Ram Prakash who saw the seat for this program along with Dr. Madhavi and Mr. S.G. and Murthy, without whom this whole thing should not have happened. I would thank Dr. Tronko for having a fantastic talk today. It just enlightened most of us and have a lot of questions on the younger generation, the future engineers of the world, I would call that. Uh, the most important thing also I would thank the Dean of SRM, Civil Engineering College, who brought up of the infrastructure because the future of any country is the infrastructure, let it be buildings, bridges, railways, anywhere. And that is going to be somewhere from four to six percent of the GDP. And this is going to be the future of the world, actually. I would thank the faculties and students of people who attended this webinar. Thank you very much. And I also thank the people who assisted us in this seminar from behind the scene. Thank you to each and everyone. I would thank our chairman, the speaker, Dr. Murthy, Dr. Madhavi. Ram Prakash, Rasek, everyone. Thank you very much. We had an awesome webinar. Thank you, each and everyone. For any queries, you can write down to ISNT Chennai chapter at gmail.com where all your questions will be forwarded to <coughs> Tronco and you will get the replies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for each and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good day, sir. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Special thank thanks you, to Prosec uh, for on behalf of thank SRM you, also. So thanks to the speaker Guido Tronka. It was very nice having you on the session. So thanks to ISNT also. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Sir. And for the participants, you can fill in the feedback link which is being given uh, in the chat box, and uh, you will be receiving the certificates to your email ID shortly. But just give us some time because it's a large number. It takes some time to make the certificates ready. Just give us some time. I think so. This uh, particular, we are coming from this. I'll just, I think so. We should start doing some more joint ventures on uh, with ISNT and uh, SRM colleges and with Murthy sir. And when Tronco, Dr. Tronco comes to India, we can do some uh, workshop on uh, civil structures yes. and other NDT on civil. That'll be very useful for the students as well as the NDT people who are working on concrete and other places. So it will be a great benefit for all the people working in NDT and for the future engineers. Definitely. We should work along. Thank you, Dr. Tonkar. Thank you, Muthi, sir. Thank you, our chairman. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.